Večer die presentatie, uh, Matthias Soudal Kampa. Um, so ik heb ook heel graag Matthias je tady naska na fakultje voor je den den uh, cestoval z Wiedne uh, sem. Uh, Matthias je architect uh, z Chile, uh, studoval na die angewandte v Wiedne a uh, teď už uh, 5-6 let uh, pracuje na Taubman College of Architecture and Urbanism uh, the University of Michigan. Uh, já ho už asi uh, 7-8 let uh, znám, je vynikající architekt, taky výzkumník a uh, učitel. A dneska Matias bude uh, mluvit o jeho práce, výzkum a uh, výuku na University of Michigan. So, Matias, I'm very happy that you could make it uh, today uh, for visiting our school. And our design studio, and I'm looking very forward to your presentation uh, today. So, you have the floor. It's just a quick change here. So, um, First of all, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, believe it or not, Henry and I worked on this lecture for about a year until it happens today, which is great. So very happy to be here. Uh, I would like to make maybe first a little correction to what Henry said, because I understood it, actually what you said in Czech. And I have to, at the same time, I have to apologize that I'm holding the lecture in English and not in Czech. My Czech is terrible. You don't want to hear me lecture in Czech. So what I wanted to correct is basically, um, Henry said I was born in Chile and I studied in Vienna. That's not entirely true. I was born in Chile, but I went to kindergarten, Volksschule, gymnasium, and studying in Vienna. So I spent my whole life in Vienna, basically. So whenever I'm asked where I'm from, I say I'm from Vienna, because that's my home. Um, so, um, a little introduction about myself and the company and so on. Um, my company is called SPAN. Uh, it was founded together with Sandra Manninger um, in Vienna in 2003. And uh, in the meantime, we were able to expand the office uh, from Vienna to Shanghai and to Detroit. Um, so the, the Vienna office by now is just a very small operation. There's only two people sitting around doing research. Most of the work is done in China. That's where the projects are these days. Um, and this lecture, in this lecture, we'll introduce you to some of the obsessions, ideas, fascinations uh, that Sandra and I share in our work and that I would like to share uh, with you. So the whole lecture is called Machine Hallucinations. And I will go into detail in the, in the lecture about why it's called Machine Hallucinations and how machines can, like, can actually hallucinate. Yeah? And in general, I consider this a post-digital conversation. Uh, this is a very contested term. Um, I don't think there's a general definition yet of what actually post-digital means. The one thing that I can say about it is that it, it has a lot to do with the crisis 2008 and the change of digital architecture after that crisis. Uh, and the interesting point of uh, Mario Carpo's presentation of his book, The Digital Turn, uh, and the question of what happens after that. But first of all, I would like to talk a little bit about ontologies of form. I'm, I would say I'm a formalist. I'm not ashamed to say that I'm a formalist. Yeah? And form for me was always very important because it is an agent of culture. It represents culture very importantly. It def defines us very specifically in our endeavor as humans to create art and, of course, architecture. So ontologies of form discuss where does form come from? Why does form emerge? What is important about form? Which rule sets are applied to it? I'm not showing this here because I'm today in Prague. I show this in every lecture I do wherever I go in the world explaining not only my fascination for form, but also where do I come from. This is the rose window of St. Stephen's in Vienna. I passed by this window every single day on my way to school, and I never saw it. Yeah? It came much, much later that I started to understand that all the things that I was seeing in Vienna 
on a daily basis going to school influenced me profoundly as an architect. The ideas of how geometry shapes form, how it, how it emerges in specific ideas of expression. Yeah? Uh, this is the pulpit of St. Stephen's, where this idea of translating natural phenomena into very specific geometrical conditions and how to translate those geometrical conditions into material is something that for sure shaped my ways of thinking about architecture. Or piles of strange things. Yeah? This is a pile of strange things, one on top of the other. Yeah? This Baroque masterpiece of the pest soil in Vienna, which is a very strange sculpture if you think about it. It's this kind of weird clouds and putties and, and crosses and saints and all mixed up in this really strange cloud. Yeah? So on the one side, you have this desire in Vienna, obviously, for the dramatic, for the spectacular, for something that has a lot of expression. But at the same time, you have in Vienna also people like this, yeah? Otto Wagner. Uh, I describe people like Otto Wagner and Adolf Loos as proto-modernists, people who very early on had an idea about modern architecture and how it should be expressed in our contemporary age. Um, if you are in this sort of tension as an architect growing up in Vienna between these two poles, on the one side this lush Baroque tradition, this very expressive Gothic ideas, and at the same time, you have the pressure from the other side, the, 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 you know, the reduced, the modern, the clean. Yeah? It's almost a schizophrenia. You need, you need to find a way how to navigate between those ideas. In this line of ideas that I like to show when I, when I do these lectures is also people like um, Hans Hollein, who were actually able to translate this friction, this tension between the Baroque desire and the modern idea into very specific methods of expression of architecture. I was also in the lucky situation that he was my teacher. Uh, so I, I probably got somehow infected also in, around these ideas. Although I'm, I, I, I think I found my own language and, and, and voice in that sort of idea. So I mentioned before this, this obsession about geometry. Like uh, every geometric, every architectural entity is defined by a specific architectural, uh, by a specific geometrical idea. So geometry is one of the main bases of, of architecture. We all know this. You, he, you hear this in every architecture education. <clears throat> but how does this express in our contemporary age? And this is one of the things that I'm very fascinated about is picking up things that were already treated in architecture and uh, and research in architecture and trying to translate them into a 21st century context. When we talk, for example, about part-to-whole relationships, yeah, where small parts actually uh, constitute a larger architectural entity. Uh, early on in our career, we started to look into these problems with exhibition designs. This was the first commissions we got where we were able to create, uh, take parts and assemble them to more complex conditions. This was an exhibition design for uh, a housing, uh, an exhibition about Austrian housing, which was on show the first time in Venice. And then, of course, the idea of how to continue with these ideas of assembl assembling elements into larger conditions. I mean, we as architects are very used to this. It's something very common. Yeah? If you think, for example, about space-filling polyhedra, sounds interesting, yeah? but in fact, the most simple space-filling polyhedron that we as architects use all the time yeah, are bricks, because they tile space without gaps in a very simple way. But apart from the shape of bricks, there is 10 other shapes that allow to do the same thing. Yeah? What bricks can do, this here can also do. Fill space without gaps. Max Brückner made a lot of research in that area researching how he can assemble geometrical objects into larger assemblies that can be defined as walls or volumes. Um, more modern ideas are, for example, things like this uh, hendecahedron, which can be assembled into more complex figures. Yeah? And based on this geometry, Sandra and I started to do installations, things like this. So even if this looks very articulated and you know, very differentiated, it's basically the same geometrical figure repeated over and over again, just differentiated through the perforations in the material. 
So in a way, we try to understand how can we use something that is modular, very simple actually, and repetitive, but at the same time allows for differentiation in terms of space. So it's not just a block, it can be configured in a variety of different ways. The, this was the first attempt where we tried this with cardboard. It was very simple, very cheap. Uh, was done in, in a couple of days. Uh, but then we had the opportunity to continue this idea uh, with a project we did for Tongji in Shanghai for a workshop that they, they held there, which was called the Particle Hut, where, first of all, we increased the number of components that we used. And secondly, we used a better material. So instead of cardboard, we used aluminum. Uh, it's laser cut with aluminum. And uh, I will show you one specific problem that comes along when you do this high resolution, lots of components come together. So you can laser cut all of them. That was super fast. I think it took one day to laser cut 3,000 pieces. Yeah? But then this happens, where people have to put them together by hand. Yeah? This one's one of the things where I became very critical about this approach, because the problem is you can in terms of digital design and fabrication, you can fabricate parts very quickly, but when they, when they need assembly, is where a lot of time and manpower goes into. So after this uh, installation, we actually put a lot of effort in automatizing that process. As usual, you know, using Grasshopper also to optimize the amount of pieces, by the way, because I think we started with 10,000 pieces, which was way too much to be done in a week, when we're able to reduce it to 3,000, which is still way too much for a week. Um, but it was built in that one week, and it was on show. And uh, I actually really like this one because it has this sort of very strict exterior figuration, and on the inside, it's a dome. And um, the funny thing is that when you're standing in this dome, you almost cannot recognize that these are all repeating pieces. Just if you look a little bit closer, you figure out that these are all repeating elements, that they're all the same geometry. So a couple of plans, and that was the final result of that installation. But this, this gives you a bit of scale, so you see how large the piece was. And of course, it was also in, uh, used very deliberately in how to use the light and shadow uh, of the piece and the, ref the, the reflective quality of the aluminum. And that's one of my favorite images from that installation. Uh, the aspect of atmosphere and, and you know, sensibility of space is something that I'm, uh, I look very much into. Um, I will sh later on show also the, the AD that I actually edited, which was discussing aspects of atmosphere. And within this line, as of course, the, the, where you increase the amount of componentry to, to, to be put together, um, this is again a little bit of another geometrical problem here. So if I was discussing now aspects of uh, part-to-whole relationships where you take one piece and assemble that to something more complex, then the Austrian Pavilion was another geometrical problem, which is topology. I'm not going to do a lecture about topology now because this would take another hour or so. It's just be, uh, understand that it's about continuous surfaces that allow to create openings without disturbing the underlying geometrical rule set. And there's a whole family of projects we did in this vein. So every time we pick up one problem, geometrical problem, we basically do a whole series of projects with it, not just one off. But the Austrian Pavilion was definitely the, the, the highlight of this series and maybe also the end point for us in that research where we were actually able to achieve a complete building with one specific geometrical idea. And it went so far that it was not only the shell of the building that we designed, not only the interior, but even down to the furniture. And it was all based on something that we call an abstract machine. Um, this model here is not really a model. It's not a model of something specific. It's, um, it's a collection of ideas within one model that can then be distributed through different projects. So we were talking in this model about continuous circulation in a building, continuous openings from exterior to interior, continuous connection from interior to exterior, and things like that. Uh, so it's not a specific project, but it gave us ideas for several different ones. And the Austrian Pavilion was one of those projects. 
Um, it was a very generative process in that we basically started with a volume that consisted of the space necessary in the competition brief for the, for the, for the pavilion, and then generated 100 models. And out of those 100 models, through uh, analysis, we started to reduce it down to one model that we then later on continued working on and refined to the final fi finished project. As I mentioned, we also designed the interior and the furniture. Um, that was actually not a given. I can tell you that um, only a small amount of pavilions in the expo, the architects were allowed to do anything in the interior. Yeah? So we, this was an exception that, the, and I'm very thankful for that, that the Austrian government actually allowed us to do also the interior. I would like to add also to this uh, something which is really interesting about this whole competition here. This was, a, this was an open competition, Europe-wide. Yeah? I think they had 190 participants, something around that number. Uh, and the one thing which is really surprising, was surprising in this competition was that a very young company yeah, uh, got the commission to build it. This was our first building, was our first building. And uh, we constantly got this question during the expo, how come that such a young company gets a project like that? And uh, there's one thing which I think is very valuable in Austria is that they actually, they actually use the expo as the opportunity to showcase a young architect's or architect's office. To, uh, because they want to, uh, it's basically a form of, um, of support that you get. Uh, so it was a really big honor to do that. And at some point, of course, also we had visit from the Terminator himself, who uh, came over for a uh, Wiener Schnitzel and a little bit of uh, Apfelstrudel. Okay, a little bit something different. You remember that I just started to talk before about the post-digital and what I mean by that. Yeah? I, I, I said that there was two specific instances that triggered this idea of the post-digital. On, on the one side, uh, the 2008 crisis, financial crisis, which um, I think m made a certain idea of architecture questionable where it is only about a specific formal approach to it. As much as I'm a formalist, I'm also an architect and I have a conscience. So I have to really start to think, how does my architecture fit in a contemporary age? The other thing that happened was the publication of this book here. Yeah? The Digital Turn in Architecture from 1992 to 2012 from Mario Carpo. You have to understand that Mario Carpo is a historian. Yeah? Uh, in my understanding, a historian has the um, authority to define faces in art. That's what historians, what art historians do. So when Mario Carpo basically says the digital turn was from 1992 to 2012, then it is a question to me, what happens after that? Yeah? Uh, and I think it's also very critical to understand that 2013, the year after this book was published, there was the Archilab show number nine, I think, in Orléans in France, and the Frac collection in Orléans has the largest collection of computational design in the world, apart, I think, from the CCA maybe in Canada. Um, so they have this huge collection of digital art and digital architecture. And what was surprising to me is how they made the show. The show was very different to other exhibitions that were dealing with the same topic before. So whenever there was an exhibition about digital design before the Archilab show, the majority of the discussion was about which technology did you use? Which script did you write? How did you use the software? How did you make this rendering? Uh, how did you make this grasshopper definition? So it was all about the technological aspect of computational design. What changed after 2012 is that the conversation shifted away from explaining projects through their technological qualities and more explaining them through their cultural meaning. What does it mean to make this form in a digital design? Why is this a progress in terms of architectural discourse? How does this respond to a social need or an economical need? So I, there was a complete change in the conversation. And I think this conversation has not yet come completely to the public, but I noticed this more and more, how architects who were involved or are involved in digital design start to discuss their projects more through their cultural meaning or philosophical implication rather than saying 
Why is this technology interesting? Because the technology is now a given. I mean, the funny thing is that, for example, digital design these days is the norm. Yeah? Every single architecture office in the world uses technologic uh, digital means in one way or the other. And if it's only to draft plans in AutoCAD, that's already a digital tool. Yeah? So when digital design is the norm, then what does, how does it contribute to what we do as architects? Not only as a technical mean, not only as a pen, but as what I draw with the pen. So in, in that vein, the process that came after that conversation started to change. So from this curvilinear things that we were doing with topological qualities to something that is far more raw and coarse and sometimes brutal if you want, yeah? but that, that picked up specific architectural problems that we have been discussing in our discipline for a long time and trying to understand how do they fit now into the 21st century. For example, the corner problem. Yeah? This is a very typical architectural problem. Every architecture student hears one time at least about the corner problem. How do we turn around from one wall to another? How do we turn from one direction to another in a building? This is something that has been treated multiple, multiple times in the architectural history. Now the question for Sandra and myself was, if we're using computational tools, how do we deal with that problem of the corner in, a, in an alternative kind of way? And it was interesting for us to try a variety of different options of how to discuss this, not only from the geometrical perspective, but also from the material perspective. So the idea to really paint that corner gold was intentional. Yeah? It intentionally picks up on, of course, unique things. I mean, everyone knows this, this kind of obsession with gold in, in Vienna that we see everywhere. Picking up the thing and actually applying them again to an architectural solution. Just a, a picture in between of things we did. This, by the way, I think is the only plane in the entire sec in the entire lecture, yeah? at least from our work. I don't like showing plans in lectures. I don't think it's so important. But what in this case is, is, is interesting is how that approach uh, delivered uh, an articulation of space almost on, on an automatic level. So this, uh, the design you're just seeing is for um, uh, four stores in Shanghai uh, that, are special, that are for companies specialized in 3D printed fashion. Yeah? Uh, so they actually wanted also their technique that they're using to make their fashion to be reflected in the building. And what we proposed was actually four concrete 3D printed <laughs> pavilions, we're talking about this before, um, this was done in 2015, I think. Um, at that time, there was already a company in Shanghai who were able to do large-scale 3D printing in concrete, uh, and we made these this four pavilions for them. Unfortunately, it was not built, uh, but there's still, there's still considerations to do it at some point. There was the interior. And along these lines, also again, the part to whole relationships idea. This is a, an office remodeling that we did also in Shanghai. I want to skip over this. I think I'm running a little bit behind with the, with the lecture. Yeah. So, okay. Um, so, as you saw, I, I, I divide the lecture into different blocks that discuss different, uh, different geometries and how those actually are applied in our projects. So we had part-to-whole relationships, we had topology, and now a little bit about recursion yeah, or fractals. Uh, I don't know if anyone knows who this gentleman, gentleman is. Anyone who knows who this is? I gave you a hint already. No? Okay. Anyone? No. Okay. This gentleman is Benoit Mandelbrot. Benoit Mandelbrot is a mathematician who actually defined the term fractals. Yeah. He came up with this, uh, uh, with this term in the 1970s. He wrote this famous book, yeah, Form, Chance, and Dimension, which to this very day is still highly influential, believe it or not, in special effects studios in Hollywood. Yeah. Because his, geometric, his mathematical definition of fractals made it possible to create computational landscapes with very low uh, need for computational power, which was a huge issue in the 70s and 80s. So, but on the other hand, 
there's other functions and ideas he proposed in this book. The main reason why he came up with the idea of the fractal was because there was a competition to measure the coastline line of England. Yeah? And because the coastline of England has all these little beaches and, and, and crevices and so on, it's very hard to measure it precisely. But the fractal mathematical formula he applied was playing with self-similarity. So he was saying the larger coastline is self-similar to the smaller part, is self-similar to a little uh, bay. So they're all self-similar. And because of that, he was actually able to calculate the coastline very precisely. Now, the same idea of self-similarity and repetition is what we also saw in this year. Yeah? In fact, the idea is very similar. It is the repetition of one specific geometrical form over and over again, yeah, recursively, to generate something more complex. In this case, it's circles in circles in circles. So basically, the idea of repetition and recursion is something that we in architecture already knew, obviously, with a gut feeling for hundreds of years before Benoit Mandelbrot came and actually proved it mathematically. Now, Sandra and I picked up this challenge of the rose window and thought, how can we apply what Mandelbrot came up with to generate our own version of the rose window? And that's what we came up with. It's based on the same logic principle as the Gothic one. It's the repetition of one geometrical rule set applied over and over again. In this case, it's not a circle. It's a more complex thing. It's actually a, um, it's a Julia set algorithm that is repeated over and over recursively to generate this complex form. Now, when we started doing these things is uh, when we thought we, had, we were lucky again. I mean, luck is uh, mentioned today already to the students of yours. Mm -hmm. Luck is a part of our job. Yeah? But uh, we were invited to do an exhibition in the MAC in Vienna, and this gave us the opportunity to show this idea for the first time in large scale in an exhibition setting, uh, creating something like a prototypical architectural environment. Uh, the good thing about these exhibitions in the MAC in Vienna is that, especially for the architects' exhibitions, there was a very specific rule that the director made to every architect he invited. And he said, it's not a retrospective where you just kind of plaster the walls full with plans and images and show a couple of models. That's not what you're supposed to do. You have to create a specific environment for this one exhibition space we give you. And I thought this was an amazing challenge. And for us, it was really fun to do this installation. And believe it or not, I think the biggest compliment we got about this exhibition was from the guard of the exhibition. He was sitting there day and night in this exhibition. And he came to me one day and said, you know what? It kind of looks like one of those uh, ceilings from a Baroque palace in Vienna. And I thought, yeah, he got it. He understood it. That this idea that the articulation of space can be transported with a different form, but the same empathy and quality of space. We also tried right away to apply this idea in an, in an urban context. Yeah? This is, of course, not an urban design what you see here. This is just, again, more like an abstract machine. It's the representation of an idea. So how can I use uh, these recursive algorithms to generate the same amount of articulation and detail necessary to create a really very vivid environment that is an urban setting? Of course, you see it's, our, it's Barcelona, and we put our thing on top of Barcelona. It's always fun to, to play around with Serdar grid. There's always something to learn there. More recently, our, our work becomes more and more angular, which is kind of interesting. Uh, using, again, the same idea of recursive geometries, uh, what, I, what we read here is, the, is the, the profound architectural quality behind this sort of imagery. So although they're abstract, you can recognize architectural features here, such as columns, joints, windows, uh, crevices, and so on. So there's, like, uh, there's all these architectonic elements present within those images, although they're not representing a specific project. Yeah, and that's, I think, is important to understand that a lot of the images I'm showing you are rather the beginning of an architectural endeavor than the final result. One more of these. And you can also understand them not only as a superficial two-dimensional facade, but you can also understand them as something that has specific volume and void, mass and emptiness and so on. So this is like a tomographic uh, animation through one of those blocks. 
that shows you how the space changes in there, if you read it in the, in the traditional architectural way, the white here is masked and the black is void, you can understand how it starts to generate these highly varying interior spaces and that they're all based not on a very specific top-down design will, but rather an emergent bottom-up design idea. So this is, not, this is all based on specific algorithms operating and creating these mass and void ideas. Then there's the question, how to apply these things really in, archi in, an, in an architectural setting? So this was all very abstract, as I just said before. So we had the opportunity to design this bar in Shanghai. Um, the funny thing is that there's really interesting jobs sometimes in Shanghai. So this one here, for example, this is a private bar. Yeah? It's not public, so you cannot just walk in there. You have to be invited by the owner of the building to get in there. It's basically designed as an entertainment area for, uh, for uh, a factory owner. So he basically invites customers and so on into his private bar. They discuss business and so on and sit around there and chat. And this is where we started to use at least the, the sensibility that was generated through the imagery before in an architectural setting. Um, it's not finished yet, so that's why there is no images of the finished project yet. Um, uh, and I was actually, but I was actually able to convince the owner that he allows me to get in with some friends if I'm in Shanghai. So if, if you're ever in Shanghai, let me know, we can hang out there. Um, also in Shanghai was this exhibition here, Sublime Bodies, where we also tried to, um, instead of just having a two-dimensional impression of that um, recursive geometry, to get something that is more spatial and 3D, by subdividing the model into layers and building this huge plexiglass block that allows us to, to show this um, uh, these sensibilities in a three-dimensional environment. And what I like about this uh, this sculpture or this model is that uh, this is a model that we want to use also for our, for a library project where we want to emphasize these qualities that you see here, these transparencies and opacities that actually start to define spatial conditions is something that we will definitely work on. We have these large illuminated boxes in the exhibition. Uh, yeah, also we showed one more time the particle hut in this show. This was a, a fun exhibition for us uh, because we had to create, a, is there a laser here? I think there's a laser. Let me see. Oh, let me do this one. Here. Laser pointer. Yeah. Do you see that? Yeah. Okay. So you see down here, there was a wall in between in this beautiful gallery, by the way. This is a beautiful gallery that was designed by Philip Yuan, a friend of us. So there was this wall there, and the, the curator of the exhibition, we were hard negotiating, we were saying we want to have just one, pro one, floor, one project per floor of the exhibition, and that's it. And he was insisting we have to show more. So what we did was this wall here in between, which has absolutely every single project we've ever worked on, just <coughs> plastered the whole wall with it, and the curator was happy then. So that was, um, but it was also interesting to see how much we have done. I, I, had, I didn't have the feeling we have done so much, but obviously there was enough to, to fill the show. Finally, in this whole series of recursive projects, um, this is an interesting thing, what happened here. Uh, so, little, little story. We were, we were somewhere in, in, in Taiyuan in China, and there was this customer, he, he, wants, to, he wants to have a school. Yeah? And we were showing him examples of things and so on, and he didn't like any one of those. And he was all the, all the time talking about the Baroque and the Baroque and here and then he liked so much the Baroque and so on. And I remember that I, I had done a couple of collages like two, three years ago that were somewhere on a hard drive because I never used them. And I was like, okay, next day, next day I came back and showed him this one image here, this one image. And the only thing he said is, it's bought. Yeah? So we, we have to, this, to do this collage now, figure out how to make a school out of it. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to get there. Uh, a little bit something different now, which is not, not the work of my office. This is actually the work of students of mine. Uh, I, I teach. I enjoy teaching very much. Um, it's, very it's very challenging to teach uh, in, a, in a specific way. And um, several, several years ago, Sandra and I actually got the scholarship. We won the scholarship from CERN to go to CERN uh, as artist in resident uh, for a couple of months. Uh, it was highly inspiring. It was really incredible. Uh, you meet really scary, intelligent people there. 
um, it was fantastic. And during our stay there, uh, they um, started to talk to us about the next stage of CERN. As you all know, CERN is the, uh, the, the most important institute for particle physics in the world. They run the Large Hadron Collider, which is the largest machine ever built by humankind. And uh, they were talking to us about the next step of CERN. So now they have that collider. They need a bigger one. Yeah? OK. So the next collider is going to be 100 kilometers. So if you see, I don't know if you have ever seen this yet. This is the, this is the current Large Hadron Collider here. Yeah? Here, this is the site of, of CERN. Uh, this is Geneva here on Lake Geneva. And that here, that would be the new collider. It goes under the Alps and underneath Lake Geneva. It's a gigantic, gigantic thing. And if you think that this here is considered now the largest machine ever built by humankind, now imagine how the, what this is going to be. I mean, this is incredible. And uh, so we came up with the idea to, to work with our students on speculative ideas about that new collider. Yeah? Uh, they, they need a new campus. They need visitor centers and so on. And what you see here, this project here, it's one of my favorite projects that came out of the studio, which said they're not going to do a visitor center, a normal visitor center. What they're going to do is they they're going to provide hiking paths along that 100 meter kilometer so that people can take a, walking a week along that line that's going to be that, that new collider. So you get almost like a physical sense of how large this project is uh, by walking along that line for a week or longer. And on the way, you find these things here, these sort of uh, uh, shrines yeah, that are in between along those lines that house actually old obsolete experiments of CERN. So they, they take out this technical piece, they exhibit it in this space, and in a way transforms from being just a, um, a scientific tool to, a, uh, to something that is more like, um, uh, what's it called? Um, um, a relict. Yeah, so it becomes a relict. And it's an image of the interior of that space. And I'm actually really proud that this uh, studio won the 2008 Architect Studio Prize, which is the prize of the AIA in the United States for the best architecture studio in the States. So that was really great. But I have to say, this was not so much my work. This was really the work of all the students. They were absolutely amazing. Uh, did an amazing work on this project. And it also landed on the cover of uh, the Architect magazine. So, but now actually for the main act. Yeah? So uh, this was all like, yeah, interesting stuff and so on and blah. But basically the lecture is called Machine Hallucinations. And we need to, dis that's actually the main reason why I'm here today, is to talk about artificial intelligence and architecture. Um, to do this, first thing we're going to do is define it. What is architecture? What is artificial intelligence? Yeah? There is actually specific definitions about it. How you define artificial intelligence. There's three specific aspects that it has to fulfill. Yeah? One is intentionality. So there must be an intentionality behind that whole approach. Yeah? Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense to use it. Now, the next one is a bit more complicated. It has to have intelligence. The problem is that in, there is like 15 different definitions of what intelligence actually is. There is, of course, organic intelligence. That's what we have as humans. Uh, but there is also machine intelligence that works a little bit more different. I don't want to go through the whole reading the definition. This would take a bit long. But the third aspect is also pretty obvious, I think, which is adaptability. That's definitely something that defines intelligence, is that you are able to adapt to, to changing conditions. And that's what we humans can do profoundly well. We have you know, proven that over the thousands of years, how we can adapt to a variety of conditions, no matter if it's weather or other problems, uh, food shortages, and so on. Now, you if you take all these three, that's going to be the basis for the conversation of what actually artificial intelligence is. But there is another question. Why use an AI? What's the reason to use an AI? Yeah? It's not using the AI for the sake of using an AI. There must be an, an intentionality again for that. The reason to do that is that it's much better to teach a machine how to learn instead of teaching it what to do. Yeah? The, the, what it means is, if you have a robot arm, yeah, and you have to program every single time, for example, when it's welding a car, yeah, 
This can be a repetitive process, right? But what happens if the same robot is supposed to not build one model of car, but four different ones? Yeah? Yes, of course, you could program every single time that process again into the robot. Or you use an AI where the robot understands that if I'm welding this point on this car, then I have to weld this point on the other one. So there is this, this idea of understanding what the job is and how to fulfill that job. And of course, that saves time and energy and so on and so forth. So there's very specific good reasons to do that. Um, you have to understand also that there's two specific directions of AI research going on these days. One is about generalized AI. So generalized AI would mean an AI that can do a lot of things at the same time. Think about the robot in Ex Machina or data in Star Trek. Yeah? He can talk, he can calculate, he can walk around and so on. And all these things at the same time. Now, this is actually profoundly difficult. Yeah? What we are doing as humans is for robots these days still almost impossible. Yeah? For example, if I'm talking to you, at the same time, my heart is pumping blood, my balance is trying to get balance so that I not fall over, um, I'm digesting food. Yeah, all of these things are actually complex processes that are all controlled by our brain at the same time. So we can, and we don't have to think about that. I don't have to think that my heart has to pump or that I have to draw in air and out, right? For an AI, this would be profoundly difficult. Yeah. The same with, you know, the agents in the metrics are similar artificial intelligence that can do several things at the same time. So let me tell you a secret here. No one in AI these days says this is possible. Everyone says, don't do that. What the people are doing today are so-called applied AIs. AIs that do one thing, but this thing they do really well. Yeah? So instead of trying to make a robot that is as human as possible, which is kind of childish, to be honest, yeah, they're actually trying to create machines that help us do things better or easier. Let me give you an example. Every one of us writes numbers differently. A little bit, bam, by hand. A little bit here, a little bit there, right? When you write a check today, no human is looking into these checks these days. It's all machines that are trying to understand which numbers did you write. And that's an AI. How this works is, is, is like this. This is a, a good example of an applied AI. This is a neural network that learns how numbers look like. And how this works is that at the very first row here, you give it thousands of images of a five in this case. So from different people, written by different people. And you feed in a couple of thousand images of that. Yeah? So it goes into the system, and then a human trains the AI to understand this is a five, this is a three, this is a two, this is an eight. This training process has to go, it, it can be in one go, like in this case, where it then goes into the incriminator and the bias filter, and then at the end, the AI understands it's a five. Yeah? The more images it gets, the more images go into the system, the more precise this prediction will be, or this definition will be. So by today, because those systems are in banks all over the world, we're not talking about two, three thousand examples of a five. We're talking about millions of examples. So that's why AI today can absolutely say, this is an eight, this is a one. Yeah? It works. OK. Another aspect which I'm highly interested in is the idea of the post-human perception of the world. AIs see the world differently than we do. Yeah? And I think it's really interesting that we're, st we're starting to share specific agencies in our world with other proponents. Uh, the humanist idea of the human being on the top of a pyramid and everything goes below that, culturally, intellectually speaking, I think we're saying goodbye to this idea. AIs see the world like this. This is um, basically how a car perceives the world, an automated car. Yeah? So the, uh, how we see the world is very different to what AIs are doing. They actually differentiate space by distance and temperature and you know, trying to make the biggest possible contrast to understand where things are. Uh, my dear friends at Michigan Robotics, that's what they do the whole day. They train AIs to understand the world, yeah? how to see the world. So that's why machine vision is so important in this case. 
Another main aspect, and it goes again to the problem of, of humanist uh, pyramid and uh, AI. AI and creativity. Yeah? This is also a very hot topic at the moment. Uh, just the other day, there was an article that came out by a uh, philosopher called John Terence Kelly, who completely denied that AIs can be creative. Yeah? But I have to say that I do not agree with him. Yeah? I can give you an example for that. What you see here is the so-called Bob and Ellis experiment that was done by Facebook Artificial Intelligence Research in 2017. So Bob and Ellis were basically two AIs that were supposed to discuss with each other aspects of economy and banking. The main goal behind it was that Facebook wants to create an AI that is so convincing that when you call a bank and say, I want to open an account, on the other end of the line is going to be an AI telling you, hmm, what kind of, open, what kind of account would you like to open? And it would sound like a human being talking to you. Yeah? All right. So they, they, they run the program, they run the simulation, have these two AIs discussing it, they go away overnight, the scientists. They come back next day, and the AIs had developed their own language. Yeah? So it was based on English, but it was saying, I can, I, I everything else, balls have serum to me, 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 and so on, yeah? So the, the interesting part here is that we don't know if this makes sense, what the AIs are talking about here. But if, if it makes sense, it's proof for creativity because they found a shorter way to discuss aspects of economy rather than using normal English by developing their own language. Yeah? The reason why this happened, actually, is because the program that these programmers wrote did not give them an incentive to use English. So the AIs used the shortest path to get to their solution. For me, this is an evidence of creativity. Now for the whole title of the lecture. Uh, you heard a couple of things now. Machine hallucinations is a title that I didn't invent. Yeah? Or let me put it this way. I put together certain things that I heard somewhere else. I'd rather put it this way. So when I was for the first time talking to these people at robotics about you know, how to use their progress in machine vision in architecture design, they started talking about dreaming and hallucinating, and all, we started to use this terminology, and I was very surprised about it. Why are you talking about hallucinations? Why are you talking about dreaming? We all remember very well this, this era in architecture of the 1980s where people were writing manifests and they were all foolish terms like dreaming and hallucinating, all these kind of things, right? What I, what I found very surprising in the case of robotics and these people was they told me they borrowed those terms from neuroscience. So they figured out that AIs, when they are operating, yeah, the way how they're operating is very similar to when we humans hallucinate. Yeah? So it's a very interesting connection here that hallucination, uh, psychedelic dreaming, all these little things are well researched enough that computer scientists can replicate this behavior through writing neural networks. And that's the way how they can start seeing things. Yeah? This is a small description. I'm just going to jump quickly over this. this is, there's more technical description here, how this actually works. Yeah? But more importantly is, is, are things like this here. You remember that I mentioned this database of numbers, yeah? fives and eights and threes. You can do the same thing with more complex information. So this is an example from some of my thesis students. Uh, Maria, Marianne Sanchez, no, uh, this is um, Hannah Dougherty, Iman, and uh, Marianne Sanchez, they created these databases uh, of, sp of basic architectural uh, features. Arches, columns, doors, uh, ceilings, uh, stairs, and so on. And created for every one of those classes one database of images that they were automatically downloading from the internet. Yeah? Every one of those databases has at least 1,000 images. More is better. Then they created a neural network that was able to pick up those images and apply them to any other architectural problem. But then they came up with something which I thought was really brilliant. Instead of using images that they found on the internet, they're starting to use their own renderings. 
And that basically means they were starting to train an AI how to apply their own sensibility on any given form. I thought that's brilliant. So basically what they did is this here. On the left you see one of these original images, original renderings, and on the right you see a neural network that is basically hallucinating this formal language to another building. Dreaming is another, so this one, the first one was a style transfer. This one now is dreaming, hallucinating, yeah? You may know this image here. Van Gogh is always a good victim for these sort of things. I don't know exactly why, but that seems to be like very common. Where they take a portrait of Van Gogh and run it through a neural network that basically hallucinates birds and lizards and so on on top of that image, yeah? So this is nothing that somebody designed in a, in a slow process. This is really first generating a database, then taking an image and hallucinating these features on top of it using a neural network. Uh, here we are again with the style transfer. Style transferring is something that people have been using you know, very loosely in, already for a couple of years where you, know, you take any sort of image and you dream dogs or, or birds or whatever on top of it. But we were really trying to understand how we can use that more creatively in an architectural context. So basically what you do is you have a style image and you have a target image. So the style image is, uh, is what you're gonna use to hallucinate on top of the target image. So for example, here the style is Van Gogh, yeah? And the, and the target image is, this is the, this is the target image, yeah? So taking this target image, you can take the style of Van Gogh and then create any sort of image that looks like a Van Gogh painting, yeah? And all of these things now st are starting to, to really slowly go down into the area of architecture and design and art. And I have here an example from art, yeah? This piece of art um, by Paris-based art collective Obvious, yeah? was sold last year for $432,000 at Christie's and is supposedly the first artwork ever done by an artificial intelligence. Uh, it's, it's a good selling point. I guess that sounds really great. But basically what it is, it's a style transfer, like we were, we were discussing before. So they actually created a database of Dutch master painters, and then based on that database, they were able to generate this here. We, what is more important here is not so much if the artwork is good or beautiful, that's not the point here. What is more important to me here is it is evidence that artificial intelligence is getting taken seriously enough that is considered an artist that generated something that is worth money. Yeah. So that again shows that we're starting to share agency in this playing field of creativity and art. Yeah. And for architecture, I think it's really funny that the term style, I mentioned style transfer before, is actually returning into the architectural conversation via the use of advanced technologies. So an idea like, like style from, from uh, Semper can be basically reread in the context of artificial intelligence as another opportunity to create a contribution to architectural discourse. Yeah? Again, you remember that I said before already, instead of us trying to discuss too much the architecture through its technological means in digital design, rather discussing it through its value as a contribution to discipline and, um, and discourse. So how do we use these ideas now in architecture? Let me give you a, a small example here of a style transfer in architecture. We all know the primordial Hong Kong high-rise facade. We've seen this in a thousand of magazines and, and so on. And then we take something like the, a Baroque church and then try to see what happens if I start, if I start to style transfer between those two, these two techniques. Yeah. At the moment, this is more like an inspirational tool than really a tool that defines a specific project, but we actually try to use it as a three-dimensional representation. At our design for the Austrian Pavilion for the Expo 2020, we didn't win it, uh, but we were close. But nonetheless, the idea was really to take uh, all these sort of Baroque ceilings from Vienna 
and create a style transfer to a modern building. So you see there's very specific modern features here, like this, the floor is very modern, there's like very specific straight lines that define it as a, as a, as a modern interpretation, but then it has that profoundly Baroque ceiling or these very articulated uh, chapels for it to exhibit some things. Now, the, what I'm showing you here is, is, again, the next step in the research for uh, the use of AI in architecture, which is how do you translate those things into 3D? You might remember that all the examples I showed you before, from the images of fifers and twos to the style transfer between the Hong Kong facade and a, and a, and a, and a Rococo church, are all images, are all 2D, right? This is what AI right now can do really well. 2D, they can do that. 3D, completely different thing. Very complicated to do. Uh, there is this group of scientists, uh, Hirohoku Kato, uh, Yoshitaka Ushiko, Tatsuda Harade from the University of Tokyo, who developed a three-dimensional style transfer technique, uh, which we tried to apply, but the more we went into the nitty-gritty of the algorithm, the more we figured out that it's not really working that well. So right now we are developing a variety of different techniques, how to extract three-dimensional information from images uh, in order to create a spatial condition. It's again some student work from my, from my studios. It's one of my favorite ones. This is a beautiful style transfer here that led to things like this here, or really strange sections like this here. And talking about strange, strange can be good, yeah? I like strange. The strange, or weird, or different, or ugly, are categories of aesthetic expressions that we might just not understand correctly. So it, maybe it's not ugly, we're just not used to it. Yeah? So things just change over time. So using all these techniques, uh, we were actually able to build, or we are currently building the first project, building project based on these AI techniques. So we took these style transfers here. We created a huge variation of different results of surfaces and, and, and conditions. All these, by the way, are based on plans. Yeah? So it's really funny for me that when you actually use really conventional architectural plans, which are completely rectilinear, and you put them through a neural network, you end up with something that's so organic. I don't know exactly why that happens, but it happens. Uh, which is actually one of the common problems in AI research right now. If you talk to AI researchers, they're going to tell you that they can set up the databases, like where is this information coming from, the, from uh, for the AI. They can set up the rule sets, how it's responding to this information, and then you get a result out of it. And in a lot of AI applications, these, these results are right and useful. But no one knows what happens in between there's still not a deep understanding of why neural networks do what they do. In any case, we went through a, through a lot of variations with these projects because sometimes these neural networks give you results that are completely useless, like this one here, yeah. or this one here. So it took several attempts to get to one result that was useful, which is this one. And this is the basis now for the rest of the project. And we're generating some colorful boulders for the project, too, playing around with coloration. Currently, this is the state where the construction site is in. We're anticipating that it's going to be ready in April next year. Now, this was basically some ideas about what we call imaginary plans, where we actually also use two-dimensional information to do that. But our most recent research is going back into the scale of the city talking about the imaginary city. So basically picking up on ideas about cities and landscapes and how those can be fused by using neural networks. And I love these very strange plans that we get out of it, where you definitely can recognize there is this sort of urban texture emerging out of, uh, uh, of the different um, uh, results. And for me, the uh, what is very, very interesting is all the things are basically unpredictable. You give them information, um, and then you get a result out of it, and very often it's actually the task of the human to interpret these results again, understanding is this useful or is this not useful? Can I do something with it or can't? Uh, and I think that might be just because this technology is so new that we don't have it completely under control yet, but 
it's again, to come back to my argument, it's rather about discussing how does it fit in the entire context of the history of urban design rather than, you know, how did I do it technically? Or the idea of, you know, how does, how does landscape respond to volumes? And because we had so much fun with it, we, at the very end of this research, we did the following. We, we designed basically an idea of how to do cities on the moon. So basically, this is an example where an AI is hallucinating the city, hallucinating cities on the moon. Yeah? And I think that's a good way to, do, to, to end this lecture by saying basically that these hallucinations are what's going to define, uh, at least in our case, our work for the next couple of years probably. Uh, we see a lot of potential in this approach. There's still a lot of work to be done there. You see how abstract still this, these results are, but they're highly inspiring in terms of seeing that we can push this forward, no matter in which scale. So this approach can be, can be applied to industrial design as much as can, can be applied to a building, as much as it can be applied to uh, the moon. Yeah? A little bit about writing. I enjoy writing, so there's a couple of books out there if you want to have a closer look into what we do. I can highly recommend the AD that uh, we did a couple of years ago. Uh, or you can also for free go to uh, um, RMIT and read also my PhD, uh, which is called Autonomous Tectonics, and basically summarizes a lot of the things I was talking about today in a very consistent and uh, complete way. And with this, I would like to say thank you very much for listening. For listening. Thank you. <laughs> questions, please, please, if you have questions, absolutely. Yes, please. Uh, um, I'm, I came a little bit late, so I'm, um, <laughs> I apologize for the no, not really sure. Um, but you spoke about it uh, in the beginning of the lecture, but what I could see um, in the end of the lecture, uh, you uh, spoke about artificial intelligence in uh, relation to this style transfer, mm -hmm. which I perceive more like an aesthetic issue in architecture. Yeah. Like a what? Sorry. Um, well, it's more about aesthetics uh -huh. rather than uh, well, architecture is a very complex discipline yeah. that has to fulfill um, uh, many criteria. So I just wonder uh, whether you, this is just your obsession, whether this is your interest, or whether you're looking into other spaces. Yeah. Uh, for, for instance, you know, uh, you have to optimize a building for a heat demand, let's say, yeah? Well, for heat demand, yeah. yeah? So you have your parametric model huh? that, is, uh, that can uh, basically, uh, there is in, in the domain you have million and million options uh, how you can vary your, your parametric model, and you're looking for a global minima. Um, now, th that, that's something that I think uh, you can use uh, artificial intelligence uh, quite easily as well. Whereas you are showing only this type of uh, uh, approach. So I wonder whether, uh, you know, you, 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 you want to also, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I can say a couple of things about it. Thank you very much for the question. It's a good one. So, I mean, the, the one thing you missed, because it came too late, yeah, is is that, is that I, I actually confessed pretty much at the beginning of the lecture that I'm a formalist. I like form, yeah? So I'm not ashamed to do something that is just formal. But uh, th there's another aspect to this which is very interesting. Every single thing that you said is absolutely possible to do with an AI too, of course. But you have to differentiate. There's two specific problems in AI research right now. One is the tamed problem, and the other one is the wicked problem. Yeah, you know the problem in engineering. This all over, everywhere is, is this problem. The tame problem would be to use an AI to, you know, do a very specific task with it. Yeah, uh, as you were saying, compare economical circumstances in 50 cities or 100 cities, and give me the best solution for this specific city if I want to create a specific project. Yeah, or. Uh, you can analyze uh, the flow of uh, traffic or the flow of people. Or there's, there's so much you can, everything you can analyze, yeah? you can put into a neural network to get results out of it that you train it to, to deliver, right? But I'm not so interested into the, into the tame problem. I'm far more interested into the wicked problem, the, the problem about 
cultural implication, agency, sharing of agency with AIs. Where are we culturally with that? What's the post-human project that comes along with it? Like these things are really interesting to me. Yeah? That's why my work might look abstract and not solution oriented in saying, this gives me now a better building. I'm not so interested in that. Yeah? I'm interested really in if we are, where are we now, you know, with us as humans in that problem that we created by generating an AI that can do specific things very well and others not that good. Yeah? This is interesting to me. If en engineering wise, you can, do, you can do great things with it. I mean, structural engineering with AI is going to be amazing. Yeah? Because you can so analyze so much stuff with using these neural networks. But it's just a matter of training it. By the way, in my opinion, the next step in architectural education would definitely be also the, to train students to use these sort of techniques. Because that's what they're going to have to do for the rest of, the, of their life. I'm already too old. It's not going to affect me so much. But these guys, it's going to affect. Any other questions? There was another question somewhere. Yes. Does this answer your question? Yes. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you for a very interesting uh, insight to AI and other stuff. Um, my question, or I have uh, two questions actually, um, is uh, how uh, public or amateurs looks or, or look on the design when you present it that uh, AI designed this or it's AI hallucinations, mm -hmm. uh, for example, or or the second question is, if you present uh, f um, the stuff, or for example, the Expo Pavilion, that uh, the part of it is uh, AI generated, or, or no, or it's your secret only. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. If I, you mean when I do a presentation of the project, if I actually mention that an AI did it? Is that, that's a good question. I'm not sure, actually, I never thought about that. Uh, <laughs> At the expo, I didn't say it. I know that. I didn't. I didn't put it in the text of the of the project or anything. Uh, with the newer projects, also the robot garden is clearly that it was important to use AI actually because the robot garden. Let me. I didn't explain that. The, the robot garden is is a garden for the new robotics institute of Michigan, of the University of Michigan, and it's it's literally a, a garden for robots because it's their testing ground. For their, for their walking robots, yeah? So that garden in itself is already a post-human project because it's not even supposed to be for humans, yeah? I like the idea that we use that process that basically is completely artificial, yeah? To create something which is for artificial beings, yeah? Um, I know this is, you can, you can criticize that. I mean, I know that people are a little bit scared about giving away um, agency in design. I'm not so scared about it because I, I know how much training, and was discussing with your students before, I know how much training you have to put in an AI to really make it work. So I think that there's so much of my work in what comes out there, yeah, which might not be, it's not me sitting down with a pen and doing stuff, it's me sitting down and writing code. Yeah? But at the end of the day, it's the same thing, because it's influencing the final outcome that's gonna be built. Right? It's just changing again the tool set. I'm not afraid of changing tools. Yeah, so I, I used to be, by the way, let me tell you one thing. When I was in high school, everyone thought I'm gonna become a painter, yeah, because I was really great painting stuff and so on, it was beautiful paintings and so on. And then a couple of years later, they were asking me, why did you change? Why, when, now you're using a computer, you were so good with doing things by hand, with your painting and so on, and I told him, nothing changed. I just using another tool to do the same thing, yeah. So it's always, there's always some sort of agency no matter what tool you use. And it's the same with AI, by the way. Yeah. So I have more direct question because I'm interested in tetrahedral mesh and I've seen you did uh, like polyhedra, yeah. and if you ever done a design from tetrahedral mesh, or if you think it's a, a good uh, way to design some things, or the polyhedra are better? 
I'm not sure if that's ever. Um, I, I'm I'm not sure. Let me think about it. I mean, the, the good thing about tetrahedra is, of course, that they're in terms of forces and and weight and so on. They're really really good. Yeah, because they, they give you like a very specific triangular structure that you can apply to any structural problem that you have in architecture. So this probably is better than using the polyhedron that, that, that I use. Yeah, because the, the space fitting polyhedron that I use is in terms of structure not as intelligent as tetrahedra. Yeah? I'm, I have no problem conf uh, confessing that. Yeah? But um, uh, I have not designed with, uh, with, tet uh, with tetrahedra. Mm -mm. Ever. Anyone else? Last chance. All right. Then maybe it would be uh, interesting to speculate a little bit. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have uh, uh, um, one of these AI assistants from Amazon here or something like that. But it would be nice to imagine that uh, here there would be a row of these uh, guys. <laughs> Of things sitting, and they could also ask questions, oh, yeah. Right. Because now we are in a very uh, still human uh, context. There's a human audience. There's a human speaker, and we have this uh, this discussion over here. But it would be interesting to see what would happen if these devices, like Siri, would now also start to ask uh, questions and what they would ask you. Um, so that's more like like a speculation. But I think this this whole idea about uh, post-human is is very very um, provoking. And also very necessary because, um, for example, just recently we are um, starting to think also about, for example, animals and plants and how to design uh, for them. Um, and now with, uh, with the advent of more advanced uh, technologies, AIs, uh, autonomous cars, drones mm -hmm. that are navigating through our cities, um, what do we have to change? in order to uh, keep the quality of our cities uh, the same? And what should we design differently for animals and drones and self-driving cars and what whatnot? Um, and it also forces us to think about what should we design for ourselves? Mm -hmm. Because we don't really think about that um, a lot. You know, we take it for granted that we know more or less how to design for people, but the moment we have to design also for robots and we have to design for drones and we have to design for animals, mm -hmm. we also start to think about yeah, but what the heck is it when we design for people? Yeah. I think that's, that's one of the more positive effects that could be happening as well. The funny, thing is that, uh, the funny thing is that one of the main researchers going on in Michigan is actually designing robots for human environments. So uh, their argument is that um, everyone is trying to automate, for example, factories, right? Uh, but most of the factories today were built for humans, not for robots, right? So what they're trying to do is to create a bipedal robot that is able to walk upstairs, up and down in conventional factories that exist today so that they can use, they can automatize old factories. Um, so again, there's this problem again. So on the one side, designing spaces for robots is one, the other one being designing robots for existing spaces to make something useful with it. The, the conversation is really crazy at the moment. I mean, it's, it's like when you start thinking too much about it, you, you get a headache, yeah? Let's avoid that. Yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? If not... Well, then, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much, Matthias. <laughs>